Today on Newswatch, turmoil marks the opening of the Democratic Party convention. Accusations of favoring Hillary Clinton over Bernie Sanders forces a change at the top of the DNC. Plus, this couple's dream of adopting a special needs child seemed out of reach until they discovered the power of the internet. And in his country, he's more famous than a movie star. Meet the spiritual father of Georgia and see why people stand for hours to hear him preach. And thank you so much for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Ephraim Graham. Scandal threatens to mar Hillary Clinton's triumph this week. She's all set to accept the Democratic Party's nomination for president, the first woman ever to rise to such a position. But that story, for now, is taking a backseat to the controversy brewing inside the Democratic Party. We've got team coverage from Philadelphia. Jennifer Wishon and David Brody have our reports. Well, welcome everybody to the city of brotherly love, but make no mistake, the love isn't exactly flowing among the thousands of delegates that have gathered here at the Wells Fargo Arena. The Bernie Sanders folks are fired up and ready to go. They see Hillary Clinton as too establishment and cozy with Wall Street. Now they have fresh ammunition, thousands of leaked emails that show a supposedly impartial Democrat National Committee working to secure the nomination for Hillary Clinton, even trying to paint the Jewish Sanders as an atheist to voters in the South. I think the Clinton people stole it. I think the correct... The Corruption is starting to become more publicly known with the WikiLeaks and such. The head of the DNC, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, will resign after the convention. That doesn't mean the end of the disunity problems, however. Liberals, unhappy with VP selection Tim Kaine, are looking to cause a stir. Uh, there's talk about walking out of the vice presidential or presidential acceptance speech. Uh, there's talk about uh, total silence, uh, remaining seated, uh, turning backs. Even with this drama, the reality is Clinton will be the nominee. She then faces the challenge of reaching out to disgruntled progressives while striking a more moderate tone for the general election. It has been the, de the Democratic Party's history that once the nominee uh, is established and we know who that's going to be, that we rally the troops and folks tend to come inside the tent. Of course, there are always those who were not coming in the tent and they never were going to be in the tent. And that's okay. All eyes will be on Bernie Sanders as he gets set to make a huge, big speech to the delegates here Monday night. Speaking of big speeches, vice presidential nominee Tim Kaine set to deliver the biggest speech of his career. More on that from CBN's Jennifer Wishon here with us in Philadelphia. Jennifer. David Kane has a lot of work to do introducing himself to Democrats. Liberals aren't happy with him. Conservatives think he's too liberal which leads many Democrats to believe he's just right. The reality about Tim Kaine is once people get to know him, they tend to like him, even if they disagree with him. And he's never lost an election. I am so excited. I've known Tim Kaine for many years. He is my senator and governor. I live in the state of Virginia. And so I know his heart, I know his commitment. Coming off one of the biggest days of his life, Senator Kane walked through his Richmond neighborhood with his wife Ann to St. Elizabeth Catholic Church. It's where the couple has worshipped for three decades. Inside, Kane got emotional at times and even sang a solo in the choir. Although he has worked to reduce abortions, he's come under fire for his support of pro-life policies. But here at the Democratic National Convention, his position is just right. He's a, a committed Catholic, a social justice Catholic. He takes that very seriously in the work that he does in the world and his work in politics is part of his outreach. Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. Let's lift him up in this place today. Several hundred Democrats followed Kane's example, gathering here in Philadelphia at an interfaith service Sunday. we in trouble, but it would not matter. I'm going to praise you anyhow. And I said, listen, Lord, I, I praise you in the morning. Oh, I praise you all day long. And even when I go to sleep, my heart keeps singing this song. I praise you. Reverend Forbes says this week, Americans will see a vastly different vision for the future. I would wish that the world gets a chance to see 
two major options. An option that they remember for people who are angry, who are afraid, versus a group that's willing to risk possibilities that we could probably do it together. But that the prospect of our working together is even brighter. So far, it's been a mixed bag, but the week is young. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News at the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia. Thank you, Jennifer. Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump publicly thanked evangelical Christians for their support in his nomination last week, and he picked up another big supporter. James Dobson, founder of Focus on the Family, endorsed Donald Trump. However, Dobson is clarifying the record about a statement attributed to him claiming Trump is a born-again Christian. I did not say that Donald Trump is a believer. It was reported in newspapers, probably a thousand newspapers around the country. I didn't say that. Uh, I talked to probably four or five hundred people that day, and one of them put a microphone in my face and asked me how it was going, and I said, I have heard that uh, Donald Trump had accepted a relationship with Christ. I don't know. I wasn't there. I don't know what the nature of that transaction was. Dobson did say that it is a good start that Trump is meeting with Christian advisors. Police in Fort Myers, Florida report at least two people are dead and 17 wounded in a shooting at a nightclub. The injuries range from minor to life-threatening. At least three people have been detained and police are looking for others who may have been involved. CBN News will be tracking this story as it unfolds. Check with CBNNews.com for updates throughout the day. Another attack in Germany last night. A Syrian man set off a bomb outside a music festival, killing himself and wounding a dozen others. A recent series of deadly attacks by migrants has created a climate of fear in Germany and put the spotlight on that nation's immigration policy. Dale Hurd is on this story. Germany has been shaken by the fourth attack in a week, this time an apparent suicide bombing near a music festival that injured 12 people. Three of the four recent attacks were by immigrants. In the latest attack, police in Ansbach say a 27-year-old Syrian who had been denied asylum blew himself up at a bar. It's being investigated as terrorism. The violence has even more Germans questioning Chancellor Angela Merkel's refugee program that opened Germany's doors to as many as a million migrants from the Muslim world. The weekend began with Friday's shooting in Munich that killed 10 people, including the gunman, an 18-year-old Iranian German with a history of mental illness. It happened while police were still investigating last week's axe and knife attack on a Bavarian train by a young Afghan refugee that injured five people too critically. Sunday night, a woman was killed and two other people were injured after they were attacked by a 21-year-old Syrian asylum seeker wielding a machete. And panic broke out on a regional train Saturday when a 22-year-old man, apparently German, threatened passengers with a knife. This is a new era for Germany, a much more violent one. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Police say the shooter who killed nine people at a mall in Munich, Germany, was a mentally troubled teen who planned the attack for a year. Investigators say the 18-year-old was obsessed with, obsessed with violent video games and other mass shootings. He'd been seeing a doctor for depression and psychiatric issues. Police have detained one of his friends, who they suspect might have known about the attack plan. The attack took place on the fifth anniversary of a mass killing in Norway that took the lives of 77 people. A parish church in England says its efforts to welcome Muslim refugees have transformed its own community. Reverend Sally Smith told CBN News three to four Muslim immigrants accepted Christ each week at St. Mark's Church. Some refugees say local mosques turned them away. Smith's congregation provided them with much needed food, clothes, shelter and medical care and even language lessons. It has grown our church. In fact, it saved our church from being a, a working class white congregation in a bit of a crumbling building that we have issues with. Post-industrial city, about 12 white people sitting there on a Sunday morning uh, singing to the old organ, um, Anglican liturgy, which is very long and wordy. Um, and it's changed us into a vibrant, multicultural, diverse, worshipping Christian community. St. Mark's recently baptized 15 refugees. 
A Christian baker is headed to the Supreme Court after a lower court ruled he cannot refuse to bake cakes for gay weddings. Jack Phillips, owner of Masterpiece Cake Shop in Colorado, refused to bake a wedding cake for a gay couple because he says it violated his religious beliefs. But a federal court ruled he could not cite his faith as a reason to decline baking the cake. His attorney filed a petition to the Supreme Court Friday saying no one should be forced to further a message they can't in good conscience promote. And coming up, as Christianity fades across Europe, one tiny nation is experiencing a resurgence of faith. Many say it's all due to one man. Christianity is dying across Europe. Churches are closing as growing numbers of Europeans abandon the faith. But we found a tiny nation where the opposite is happening. As George Thomas shows us, thanks to the effort of one man, Christianity is not only alive, but thriving in the country of Georgia. On any given Sunday morning, you'll find most churches in Georgia packed with the faithful. And one of the first things a visitor will notice is that there are no pews or chairs in most Georgian churches. That's because, unlike typical church meetings, Christians here stand during their services. We say that uh, Orthodox Christians are like candles because they stand before God in churches. It's uncomfortable to stand for two hours, three hours in a row, but we, we choose to. That was the case during a service at Holy Trinity Cathedral in Georgia's capital of Tbilisi. As thousands stood listening to their nation's most famous citizen. His name, Ilya II, and he leads one of the oldest Christian communities in the world. The history of the Georgian church dates back to the first century AD when the apostles of Jesus Christ entered Georgia and preached the gospel. At 83, this elder statesman has been affectionately dubbed the most trusted man in Georgia. He's the spiritual father of Georgia and a wonderful example of what it means to be a humble servant of God. You've probably never heard of him, but here in Georgia and surrounding countries, Ilya II is more famous than movie stars and politicians. Patriarch Ilya II is the most respected figure in Georgian society. In fact, his favorable poll numbers are over 90%. In an exclusive interview conducted at his private residence, Ilya II, whose official title is Patriarch of the Georgian Orthodox Church, spoke with CBN News about his country's deep love for God. The church's past is intertwined with the people and history of our nation. In the 4th century AD, Christianity was officially declared as a state religion. That makes Georgia one of the oldest Christian countries in the world. Tucked between the Caucasus Mountains and the Black Sea, more than 85% here say they belong to the Orthodox Church. And while many neighboring European countries have seen religious adherence fall, Christianity in Georgia is witnessing unprecedented growth. We are like a little spiritual oasis in the middle of this region. Patriarch Ilya II was installed back on Christmas Day 1977, and since then he has managed to single-handedly revive the Georgian Orthodox Church. He took over at a time when Christianity was under severe persecution from the Soviet government. The Bolshevik invasion in 1921 witnessed the unmerciful destruction of churches and monasteries across Georgia. Sergo Vardolsanitse is a professor of Georgian history. There were 1,500 churches and 1,600 clergymen active in Georgia. When the Patriarch was installed, there were only 50 churches and barely 70 priests remaining. He initiated a range of reforms to rebuild the church, including an emphasis on young people. He reached out to the youth, encouraging them to attend church and to consider the priesthood. He also took steps to make church services more engaging and easier to listen to. The church showed signs of revival in the late 1980s. Men like Ione Gamrekeli, impressed by the patriarch's humility and dedication to service, decided to join the priesthood. The patriarch stretched out his hands to the people and the people responded. He preached God's word and people turned to God. 
Then came the Soviet Union collapse in the late 90s, which led to Christianity's renewal. The changes have since been profound. Now there are more than 2,000 active churches, with new ones being built every year, like this massive structure rising on the outskirts of Tbilisi. Also, more than 3,000 people have joined the priesthood, serving the spiritual needs of Georgia's nearly 4 million people. It has been said that the Patriarch inherited a church that was severely persecuted and covered in shroud. Now it is a living body. Nearly three hours after arriving for the service, a slow and frail Patriarch Ilya II finally makes his way through the throngs of worshippers that have gathered to hear him speak this Sunday morning. CBN News is granted unprecedented access to film as hundreds of men, women and children line the ornate halls of Holy Trinity Cathedral to receive a prayer or special blessing. The Patriarch always says that all that's been achieved during his reign is because of the Lord's will. After decades of religious repression, many are grateful that the church in Georgia has not only survived but is thriving thanks in part to one man's desire to bring his nation closer to God. Many kind achievements have been accomplished and I thank God for letting me undertake such endeavors for our nation. George Thomas, CBN News, in Tbilisi, Georgia. Next, meet a couple who dreamed of adopting a child and see how the internet helped to make their dream a reality. Welcome back to News Watch. Adoption can be a long and expensive process. In fact, many couples hoping to adopt simply can't afford it. But as Charlene Aaron shows us, the internet offers unique solutions to help foot that bill. Randall and Kelly Nichols knew from the time they married that they dreamed of adopting. It's kind of always been. Yeah, I mean, when we were dating, we, we, we talked about how one day we wanted to adopt. After several years and three children of their own, the dream still remained. Initially, they planned to adopt a special needs child within the U.S. That all changed when they saw a picture of a little girl in China named Isla. When I saw they posted her picture and I was, I knew this is, this is our daughter. Bringing Isla home, however, would be a challenge. We did not have money for adoption. We did have enough for right. a domestic adoption, and that's why we right. kind of started there. But when we saw the, you know, the cost that it would, that would be involved with an international adoption, just thought, man, there's just no way we can do this. While U.S. adoptions cost up to $26,000, an international adoption can run from $35 to $40,000. The Nichols tried various ways to raise the funds needed to bring Isla home. We did a number of different things with yard sales, and we made t-shirts and um, sold bracelets and, um, you know, begged our friends. When praying about how to proceed, the Nichols turned to the popular crowdfunding site GoFundMe. Hi, we're the Nichols family, and this is our adoption story. We had to trust God for every dollar, no matter you know, what the dollar amount, and we knew that we couldn't do it alone. GoFundMe allows people to contribute online to causes they believe in. There have been more than 3,000 adoption-related fundraisers in the last four years, raising more than $6 million. Their campaign started off slow, then began to pick up momentum. Friends, family, and even strangers contributed more than $40,000 toward their adoption effort something both Randall and Kelly found very humbling. What we saw was there were some people who gave multiple times. Right. They Sacrificially, were, too. Yeah. Not like, this is extra money that I can give. Like, we're going to go without something to give you. Like, single mom mm -hmm. taking care of her mom and daughter, giving us, you know, $500 mm -hmm. every time we turned around. After an 18-month journey, the time finally arrived to meet their little girl face to face. She reached for me. I wanted her to come to us when she was ready and she reached for me. I couldn't stop crying, you know, and it was kind of hard to like just be in the moment without, you know, wow. feeling a little bit out of control. At their homecoming, 
supporters greeted them with love and fanfare, many calling Isla a celebrity. There were probably um, 20 to 30 people at the airport when we got there, at you know, midnight. at 1130 yeah, at night. Perfect. Um, signs and everything. Yeah, right? yes. just to celebrate. The Nichols admit raising a child with special needs is challenging. Isla has a heart condition that has led to one open heart surgery, and she's set to undergo another procedure soon. Still, her parents say that all pales in comparison to having her as part of their family. It's hard to think of them because the, the joy that she has brought us is yeah. so far outweigh the challenges. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Welcome home, Isla. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Operation Blessing is helping pregnant young women for enter motherhood on their own. Its Young Pregnancy Program in Peru teaches women just like Jalisa how to safely deliver their own babies. That knowledge proved to be helpful when Jalisa suddenly went into labor while visiting her grandmother. Unable to get to a hospital in time, she delivered her healthy baby boy, Angel, on her own. Jalisa learned how to confidently give birth with Operation Blessing's help. She and her son are healthy and thriving. You can learn more about Operation Blessing by going to its website. There you see it, ob.org. Well, right now it's time for your Monday motivation, and here is a point to ponder. God is the only omni needed in your life. He is omnipresent and omniscient, and He is on your side. That means the all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present God is working it out for you. There is no greater force, no greater person, and no greater thing to have on your side. That is certainly motivation for your day and all the reason you need to make this a marvelous Monday. That is going to do it for this edition of CBN Newswatch. Remember, you can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about at CBNNews.com. We'd love to hear what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can do that on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Hope you'll join us again right here next time. Once again, make this a marvelous Monday. We'll see you right back here tomorrow.